There is a fable from India about a rich man who is traveling far from home. And a poor man notices his fine clothes and his bulging money bag. And he decides to travel with him and to look for a way to steal his treasures. Every night in the humble inn along the roadside, the poor man unrolls his bed roll early and pretends to sleep. And then as the rich man leaves the room to go and get all washed up, the thief rummages through his belongings in search of the treasure sack. Now he can never find it. And as soon as he hears the rich man's footsteps, he leaps back into his bedroom, always certain that he is just moments away from finding the treasure. Every morning, the poor man once again pretends to sleep until the rich man goes down for breakfast. And yet, morning is the same as evening. The thief can never find the money back. So day after day, this goes on until the two men finally reach their destination. As they are parting ways, the thief's curiosity gets the best of him, and he admits to the rich man what's been going on. He said, did you guess that I was out to rob you? And the rich man said, yeah, I guessed that the very first night. The man said, well, then where did you hide the treasure? And said, well, it was very simple. Every night while I went to get cleaned up before bed, I slipped into the room and I put the treasure under your pillow. And every morning after you rifled through my belongings, I went and got it back. It was under the thief's pillow all along. Sometimes we miss the treasure that is close at hand. And I think this was the point that Jesus was trying to get across to the disciples. He asks them, have you understood all of this? After telling them several obscure parables to describe God's reign in the world, he told them the kingdom was like a mustard seed, the kingdom was like yeast, like treasure hidden in a field, like fine pearls, or like a net tossed out to sea where the good catch is sorted from the bad afterward. I imagine the disciples' heads were spinning at this point. The kingdom is like what? They, like we, wanted to know how Jesus was going to change the world. They wanted to know how Jesus was going to help them get rid of their oppressors. They wanted to know how Jesus was going to bring about a revolution that would change the world as they experienced it. In short, they wanted to know how Jesus would overthrow the worldly government that had ruled over them. How could a mustard seed? How could some yeast? How could some hidden treasure, pearls, sorting out the catch of the day, accomplish any of this? What they didn't understand is that Jesus is about the joy that comes from discovering something priceless while pursuing the ordinary. My friends and family are all about eBay, Craigslist. Not me, my friends and my family. And they're all about this wonderful yard sale pleasure that they can attain. You can bid on and buy virtually anything that you can think of. Well, maybe Jesus loves eBay too. Now to be clear, Jesus is not an avid collector of Star Wars, Transformers, Godzilla, Michael Jackson, memorabilia, or a seller of some knockoff Gucci purse. No, Jesus might love eBay because Jesus loves a good deal. 
Now, sort of like the example that I shared last week, there was a British antique dealer. He paid $5 for an old film container. And inside, he found a never-released seven-minute movie feature featuring Charlie Chaplin. And it was valued at $60,000. $5 for $60,000. And it's the feeling that an American literature professor had after paying $481 for a photograph of the poet Emily Dickinson. And the snapshot is just the second photo of Dickinson known to exist in history. Which makes this a priceless discovery. Then there's Kent Devery, who paid $25 for a used Blackberry. We know how that is. $25 for a used Blackberry. He later discovered the phone contained the numbers and email addresses of 50 major celebrities, including Academy Award winner Natalie Portman and Kevin Spacey. Now, you can bet someone was willing to pay a pretty penny for that info to be erased or for the phone to be returned. Now that's a good deal. How do we know? How do we know? Well, Matthew, with its parables about hidden treasures and pearls of great price, tell us so. Jesus is all about the joy that comes from discovering something priceless while pursuing the ordinary. In fact, for Jesus, the greatest of such joys, the most magnificent of flea market finds and unexpected eBay treasures, is none other than the kingdom of heaven. In the parables this morning, Jesus tells us that the very reign and rule of God, the loving and life-changing activity of God in heaven, has broken into our world and is available right now right this very minute. It's here to be discovered. It's here to be embraced. Yet like some prize baseball card sitting in a shoebox at some grandmother's garage sale, the realm of heaven is found in unassuming places and encountered in unlikely ways. And whatever it costs for you to get it, it is well worth it. So the big question then is this, in what unlikely places do we find God's power and presence? Some think the key to discovering God is in getting mystical and otherworldly. They might espouse some process of escaping the trappings of flesh and world and ascending to some higher plane where God abides. But that doesn't seem to jive with Jesus' idea of the kingdom being uncovered in the ordinary, now does it? I can remember my late mother wanting to do some redecorating in the two bathrooms at their house. So on multiple trips back and forth to Florida, I went with my mother to look at flooring and possibilities for converting a tub into a shower. And after a couple of shopping trips, she told my father what she wanted to do. And she said, here's what I want to do with the bathrooms. Imagine the tub being a shower and the vanity being made into one large enough for us both. <laughs> you can see this dumbstruck look on my father's face. She repeated all of her ideas again with a lot of excitement. She said, do you understand? And I remember him simply nodding and going, yes, dear, that, that sounds great. But it was clear he didn't understand. He could not imagine what she was envisioning. In today's passage, the disciples were treating Jesus the very same way, simply nodding in agreement without really understanding, just so that Jesus would go on and move on to something else, something they really did understand. 
So I argue that the key to connecting with the kingdom is being good enough to gain admittance. You know, help enough old ladies across the street, donate enough money to charity, make a lot of people smile, make very few people cry, and when your days are all done, boom, you're in the kingdom. But that seems at odds with Jesus' own description of the kingdom as treasure being stumbled upon in a field as if it is something freely given. Encountering God, experiencing God's power, and being caught up in God's love must be things that we encounter in the ordinary and access easily. What about here? Is this the place where we encounter the kingdom? Think about that for a moment. Jesus' ultimate point in the parable is that he was the means by which the kingdom had come to earth. It was in him that the love of God, the power of God, and a reconciled right relationship with God could all be received. Christ and his work on the cross are the treasure in the field and the pearl of great price. And this is the place, this is the place where that very same Jesus is to be encountered today. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that when we gather here in this unassuming place, that the greatest treasure in the history of God's universe is here for the taking? Do you believe that when God's word is read here, preached here, sung here, that Jesus is speaking here? Do you believe that when you hear, you are forgiven of the sin, that you're forever a member of God's family? Or take and eat this bread, this is body, take and drink from the cup, this is my blood. Do you believe that the power and promises of Christ are taking hold in you and doing something miraculous in you? To be sure, by sight and sound alone, this seems like the last field in which you'd find something so special. This place is filled to the brim with imperfect people, and we preach a message of forgiveness and hope to an unbelieving world. And out there, they think it sounds like absolute insanity. Here's another one to wrestle with. What if the work of the kingdom is not only found here, but is also found in you? Have you thought about that one? If you're a baptized, believed follower of Jesus Christ, then the scripture tells us that you are now a living, breathing field filled with the priceless treasures of Jesus. Filled with the priceless treasures of Jesus. I'm reminded of another parable, not one told by Jesus, but by other traditions that tells the story of a woman who found a precious stone. She found this precious stone, and she went and she put it in a bag. This was her bag and her belongings with her precious stone, and she went on her own way. And the next day, a hungry traveler came by, passing her on the road, and asked if she had anything to eat. And so she grabbed her bag and she rummaged through to see if she had anything to eat. She said, no, I don't. But I have this precious stone. And, and I can give you this precious stone instead of food. And she handed the stone over to the man. And the traveler left and he felt elated. Because he had something better than food. 
He had something that he could sell to get food for a long time. And so he hurried off to town to enjoy his newfound riches. And a couple of days passed, and again the woman was traveling the same road, and she ran into the same man, and he approached her and he handed her the precious stone. And he said to her, I had intended to sell this stone and become rich. But after I thought about it, I realized that you gave me something even more precious. And the woman asked, well, what is that? He says, I want whatever it is that you have that made you able to give me that stone. Yes, we as a community and as individual believers are the unlikely, ordinary, and easily accessible places where the greatest treasure in the world can be found and encountered. With that realization comes an incredible responsibility. We, you, are the field for the wandering to stumble upon salvation. We are the marketplace for the seeker to finally find what they're looking for. We are the online auction where a hurting world can bid on trash and receive untold treasure in the form of forgiveness unlimited and life unending. If any of you have been watching any of the movies this summer, they just might seem strangely familiar. Transformers, number four, how to Train Your Dragon, number two. Yet another Spider-Man. Oh, we get Godzilla this summer. Planes. Yet again, it seems that Hollywood has dragged out the old and insisted that it is new. Sure enough, there's room for nostalgia and repackaging in our entertainment. But shouldn't there be more new than old? The church runs into the same problem. In Matthew, Jesus instructs his disciples to bring both old and new treasure out of the storehouses. Both the old and the new. It's tempting for us as God's people to default to what's old and neglecting the newness of what God is doing. One of the more popular shows on cable television, and I got to watch it last night, it's on A&E, and it's called Storage Wars. And it follows a group of men and women who make their living bidding on the opportunity to take ownership of unopened, repossessed storage units, all in the hopes of finding some hidden treasure. Now this is a television show, and they have discovered everything from coffins and artwork to the world's most valuable comic book collection, all the while paying ten dollars to take it home. Oh, the pleasure of a good yard sale. On the other hand is the program Hoarders Buried Alive, where they try to acquire anything and everything to access until it reaches the ceiling. All of their buried treasures, the disappointment of yard sales to all of their family and friends. We have a lot in common with such modern-day treasure hunters. Did you know there's a new game that people are playing? Now, if you happen to find somebody snooping beneath bushes over across the street in our public buildings at the courthouse, or scouring beneath lampposts, glancing at their smartphone or a GPS device, all the while talking to each other about treasures. Don't be alarmed. They aren't thieves. 
they are likely geocaching. It's a game. It's a game of outdoor treasure hunting where one can find hidden loot in public places all the while following a set of coordinates that are posted online. And this game is taken off around the world where the official website geocaching.com you can go and find out how to play maybe we can get a, a group together here at church Presbyterians geocaching but ask any avid geocacher and they'll tell you that it's not about the treasure which is often just a piece of paper to sign your name and a cheap trinket as a souvenir it is about the hunt it's about the hunt Jesus says that discovering the kingdom of heaven is a similar game. Only as the church, we are not to find it, but to facilitate it for others. If we will open ourselves up, untold treasure awaits us. The kind of treasure that only God himself can offer. Jesus says, have you understood all of this? He asked the disciples and he continues to ask us. Have we understood that God's realm is not about worldly ways, not about worldly riches, but about the abundant richness of the Holy Spirit. Have we understood that God's realm is about gladly giving away ourselves and all we have to anyone and everyone who asks for it? Have we truly understood, as Paul told the Romans, that no earthly power can separate us from God's realm? Our Lord loves a steal of a deal and the joy that comes from discovering something valuable, possibly priceless, while pursuing piles of ordinary items. Why? Because he's offering the most incredible item around. He's offering himself Free of charge. May this be a place where the treasure of Christ is easily encountered. May the treasure of Christ be accessible.